and welcome to the 41st episode of Total Pop Mode, your weekly comedy gaming podcast. My name is Will, and I also go by Hoodafunk, and I'm joined here by my good friend, co-host, and fellow gaming enthusiast, James, aka Mr. Bames. What's going on, you wondrously wobbly warthogs? Coming up this episode, we've got our weekly regular games catch-up, followed by news of a new release, and then rounding off with coverage of the PlayStation Showcase 2023. Exciting. Before we round off the end of our episode with the final part of our ventures into the world of Code Vein. But before we get into all of that, it's time to lay out the socials. You can, as always, find the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and pretty much anywhere else you get your podcasts by searching for Total Pop Mode. We also post regular video content of our playthroughs, stream highlights, as well as the podcast on our YouTube channel, Total Pod Mode. You can also find us on Twitter by searching for at Total Pop Mode, or one word. And whilst you're there, you can find me at Mr. Bames, and I'm also on Twitch under twitch.tv forward slash Mr. Bames underscore TPM. And you can find me at Hoodafunk on Twitter, and I'm also on Twitch under twitch.tv forward slash hoodafunk. Okay, James, catch me up. What have you been playing this week? I carried on playing Scarlet Nexus, which I spoke about last week. Very nice. How are you getting on? So I managed to finish the first character's storyline, but honestly, by the end of it, I was so ready for it to be done, and it, it outstayed its welcome, like, proper hard. I'm talking not even the final boss. The second to last boss had four health bars. Really? Wow. Yeah. Okay, that's some serious... It was like three mini-bosses, each with a health bar. And when I say mini-bosses, I mean they were actual bosses, but they were kind of small. Ish. Okay. And then the fourth phase was they all joined together and made this big thing. Right. Activating Megazord Battle Mode. Which is cool, but it's cool, it but sounds like. But when I was, I was so done for this point as well, like because. <laughs> Like the enemy variation, uh, despite being really cool looking enemies, which you would have thought you could do so much with given its household objects and various bits of clutter. Yeah, I like this. They became too samey at the end. I was so bored of just killing the same things over and over again. And unfortunately, because of the limitations on the melee side of the combat, it just all got very boring to me very quickly at the end. Like I was really enjoying it up till maybe the last, each chapter is called a phase, probably the last two phases. I was like really into it and the story was wicked throughout out, which is really the reason I finished it and the reason that I'm actually considering doing a second playthrough in many 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 months right okay yeah it sounds like you need to take a little bit of the breather but see the other side of the campaign yeah I mean I sort of know what happened because they go into it because basically your both squads join up towards the end and everything that's gone on is like it all has a logical reason from the other side but I want to actually play through it and see what happens yeah um because this game becomes about, it's a lot of time travel bollocks. So you've got characters that go back in time to find out information from the past that's pertinent to the future. And then you've got a character who learns how to time travel, who then goes right back to the very beginning of the storyline, assassinates someone and then takes their place. And there's all sorts, okay. it's all sorts of not paradoxy shit because it kind of works, but it's all very, it gets very weird in a very cool anime way it sounds like you need to untangle all of that and get the other side of the story yes and the fact you've said untangle is very pertinent because there's a lot there's actually tangles of red strings that you have to untangle in the game so oh, yeah, of course you made <laughs> yeah. a pun without meaning to that's that's pretty cool um but yeah but honestly the overriding feeling when i finished it was thank f- that this is done it was just too much by the end unfortunately but having said that i would still recommend playing the game the story is great and someone with more patience than me or who liked it more than me would probably really enjoy it i just didn't like how dragged out it became in the end it wasn't death stranding levels but it was pretty bad sure thing in terms of those final bosses was it just one after the other and then they finally combine or did you have to kind of defeat one and then move on somewhere else defeat the other one it was literally one after another. Right, so just kind of major boss rush, but also quite repetitive, it sounds like. Yeah, they did have different moves, but it was the same sort of thing you had to do. So there was no change in the gameplay element of it, if Fine. you see what I mean. The final boss was cool, but it, then it just it was just too long. <laughs> there was too many breaks where there's like they're doing like cool anime stuff, like, you know, where you, you have a breather and you talk to one another about what's going on. It's just, it was just too much. Oh, that's cool. You have a little uh, segue in the fight to have a little chit chat. Yeah, sort of I like thing. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's fine the first couple of times, but when you get but to... is this something that repeats itself every time you die? So you just have to repetitively go through it. I didn't die. That that thank God, <laughs> <laughs> my goodness, no, that's what I mean. It was just so long. 
def- and also then between defeating the final boss and actually getting the end of the game achievement, I think it was about an hour. Right. The cutscene stuff was cool because it was good context, but there was bits where you just you're literally walking around talking to people, just waiting for something to happen. And it was just like, ah, oh, you could have done all this in a cutscene and we could be over with here. That was just that was my impression at the end anyway. I'm probably being a little bit unreasonable because <laughs> I was ready for it to be done. But that sounds like the opposite sort of situation that I normally expect, where I'm like, damn, that was really cool. I wish that was in a actual gameplay element rather than a cutscene you were like come on make yeah. out with the ending <laughs> yeah well no but it was it was literally you're just going to each character and talking to them and then scrolling through text that could have been done in a cutscene fine, didn't, fine. didn't need okay, me to yeah. walk around and do it do you know what i mean is that sort yeah of that's yeah fair enough so i'll leave it up to you whether you want to answer this question now or later on in the podcast but i'm conscious that last week you mentioned that you were craving for a little bit more code vein but however we do agree to uh complete up to a uh, certain point each week i'm wondering now that you have completed this do you have a preference over this one or code vein considering that this was your your kind of interim fix oh yeah it's, that's the easiest question in the world ever code vein by Co- right, a okay. hefty margin <laughs> like no disrespect to scarlet nexus it, i did enjoy it the story and it was a pretty good game and it was you know the combat's fun it just the enemy variation and stuff just got to me at the end of code vein is just a better game in my opinion i prefer it i was gonna say fundamentally it does sound like although they are kind of melee fighting games the systems themselves are quite different so again i think that probably has a lot to do with it in terms of your preferences whether you want something a bit more soulsy or something a little bit more hack and slash uh, is that a fair comparison it is a fair comparison but don't think of it as a hack and slash like the old school god of wars it's not that sort of hack and slash i, I don't really know how to describe it it's kind of somewhere in between that and a jrpg it, but not really but sort quite of. simple in terms of the hack and slash mechanics in terms of the hack and slash mechanics yes it's the stuff around it that you do that's quite cool but it's just it's much more limited in scope there aren't as anywhere near as many combinations as you'd get in a hack and slash game if so I mean. fine yeah yeah. It sounds like there's definitely more to pick up with this other side of the story, but I don't blame you for putting that one off for a while, given yeah. the ending, it sounds like. It sounds like I'm slagging the game off, and to a degree I am, but I did enjoy it, and, like, and the story is excellent. Like, go check it out if you want just a good story. It's really, really cool. But yeah, I need... <laughs> I need some time before I do the Kasane run, unfortunately. Mm. But other than that, um, I just uh, started playing Skyrim again. Oh, okay. New character, no doubt. New character, yeah. Are you playing this playthrough vanilla, or are you downloading some mods? Vanilla for this one. Got to get the 100% on the Steam account, then mod away for the next one. Nice. And uh, what class did you go for? What's your kind of intentions for this character? I'm not 100% sure yet. At the moment, I'm doing one-handed and shield um with a sort of mixed armor focus because i haven't decided which one i'm going to properly spec in probably heavy but we'll see okay. and i'm sort of playing a slight thief but a bit of like you... a, a pilfering warrior that yeah, you got kind of yeah that's probably a fair way to put it not doing like too much sneak archery but like you know bits in there but as i say early days haven't quite decided exactly where this character is going to go yet it sounds like you're taking a similar playthrough to i guess what a lot of people would probably do on their first playthrough of a game like <laughs> this they're kind of middling for the moment but you'll probably find a path later down the line once you've decided what you want to do kind of yeah i mean that's a fair comparison but it's uh, very for completely different reasons i'm just confident that when i decide what i'm going to do i'll have no problem achieving it but yes yeah, so maybe more to say on that in the coming weeks but for now i'm going to keep my cards a little bit close to the chest until the character's a bit more fleshed out all right then keep your secrets but that's it for me this week man how about you have you managed to get into any more tears of the kingdom i did indeed yeah so i've played a little bit more of tears of the kingdom this week exploring some of the additional areas in the game so as i mentioned last week there's also a you know there's a sky kingdom floating above the map there's also a depths area down below that you need to activate various routes to spread light across the area because obviously it being underground it's completely covered in darkness heaven and hell vibes pretty much yeah (laughs) it's definitely got that kind of vibe it kind of vaguely resembles uh that sort of deep underground area in minecraft i think it might just be called the end i'm not sure but is that the ember or ender ender i I think it's just called the end i think so uh yeah it it kind of has a bit of a resemblance to that uh you've also got you know similar challenges in terms of the fact that you need to light up the area 
You can use uh, glowing plants and attach that to your bow to kind of shoot out, as I think I mentioned before, just to keep the area lit up. Yep. I've also just been kind of doing quite a bit of exploring of the early starting area, mucking around a little bit with the abilities a little more. I've finally encountered a large golem that had a base on top of it, like you see in one of the trailers, where you see Link piloting like a large vehicle with attacking components on it. I was just wandering around, not really equipped with anything, so I kind of had to beat a bit of a haste retreat completely unarmed at that point but i'm really enjoying what the game is putting down at the moment uh in terms of the combat and things that's gotten much more developed from my opinion i like the ability to fuse a shield with a sword especially uh some of the heavier two-handed weapons in the game that previously you weren't able to parry with by fusing whatever equipped shield that you have with a sword you're able to then parry with the heavier weapons in the game as well Oh, very useful. And kind of a play on your sort of big stick used with a big stick in the last episode. Shout out to the big stick, big stick. <laughs> that is very effective. What's more <laughs> effective, however, is using something like a long, far-reaching weapon like a spear or a halberd, and then equipping a long, two-handed Zweihander type sword to Ooh. the end of that. So you have this extremely long-range weapon that is very fast and stabby like a spear is, but you also convey the same damage as a two-handed Zweihander type weapon, which is, yeah, fantastic. Really, really enjoying those elements of play. Yeah, and f*** physics. Physics be damned! Yeah. yeah. <laughs> In a game that's famed for its physics, physics be damned! Uh, I quite like that irony, though. I like that irony. It's cool. Yeah. It's really it's cool those, that you can do that. It's all about about fun yeah. sort of thing i think is the main thing it's it's all about fun and it's definitely providing a hell of a lot of that yeah proper sandbox that's what we like other than that my progress in terms of actually exploring the wider world has been very minimal i've mostly been stocking up on finding the very early surrounding shrines around the first area that you start in the game <sighs> sorry and i've all ptsd mate sorry <laughs> <laughs> Those shrines. 155 yeah, shrines in the new game, apparently. Wait, 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 wait! Is there really? I okay. think so. Okay. Fucking mental. I'm pretty sure I've mentioned on the podcast previously I found Breath of the Wild a very meditative experience and I feel like this game certainly speaks to that same sort of mood. I can sit there and just relax, stick it on. It's not overly challenging when you're just exploring provided you stick in the good parts of town, so to speak. You don't <laughs> yeah. want to find yourself in a late game area. However, for the most part, I'm just sort of doing some gentle puzzling and exploring at the moment. Still got loads more to explore. Still yet to explore the four main areas in the game that you're supposed to invest in order to cure the blight. You meant to urgently investigate. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's very much kind of one of those things where, yeah, there's this terror sweeping across the land, but ultimately you're probably going to spend about uh, 300 real-time hours just kind of exploring the world. You'll get around to defeating Ganondorf at some point. I think this game is definitely deserving of the positivity surrounding it. As far as I can tell so far, this is definitely living up to the hype of that whole unparalleled freedom that we were hearing in some of the reviews. Yeah, it's, it certainly sounds like it and, and seems like it from what I've seen and read. Uh, I've got to ask the question, mate, is the performance still holding up? It is, yeah. It absolutely is still holding up. And a lot of the time with the powers and things that you're using, when you're using them quite heavily, you're inside the shrines for the most part. When you're outside the world, I haven't noticed any real significant frame dips at all. There is a slight bug that I've noticed when you climb up really thick trees and there's a lot of foliage around. If you turn the camera, you get weird frame dips, but that's the only kind of significant frame dip that I've noticed and it's so infrequent that you actually yeah. climb up to one of those trees and do it was just one of those things i noticed one time and it's never really affected gameplay since yeah. then i wonder if there probably will be a fix for minor things like that down the line but no other than that the performance has been truly truly sturdy excellent really that's what good we like stuff. to hear that's what we like to hear what are you saying pokemon violet look at that look at that shit. <laughs> <laughs> day one that was exactly. out the box <laughs> out the goddamn box so yeah, no, other than taking my kind of first baby steps around the ground level of Tears of the Kingdom, that's pretty much it for me this week, man. So uh, let's take us on to the gaming news. Okay, man, so our first news story of the week, the long-awaited and predictably ill-fated Lord Ooh. of the Rings Gollum has finally been released to scathing reviews. He's a poet and he doesn't know it, folks. I know. Do you like my writing? I've Lyrical been, I've been miracle, working. baby. <laughs> <laughs> I never had high hopes for this game, looking at early footage of the game from what feels like over a year ago now. However, it seems in that time that they've done very little to alleviate those concerns that I did have. Do you know what's really weird about this? Because I have the similar concerns too. They've made it look worse. 
<laughs> like, that's I what I don't get. <laughs> I don't know whether it's worse or we're just seeing more of the same thing maybe. so that it feels worse. I think it's kind of like an optical illusion. Maybe. Or maybe it's like, <laughs> oh, that's actually been released now and it still looks like, oh. Yeah, it's the added disappointment yeah. of, oh, they didn't move on. Right. Yeah. And also the fact that, yeah, the longer you stare at it, the worse it gets. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Nobody likes you. So uh, in this game, you play as Gollum, who is the well-known misfortunate and tragic creature from Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and Hobbit series, although this game takes place before the events of the Fellowship of the Ring. So I've got to say, uh, the gameplay graphics, as James kind of alluded to there, it does look very uninspired and bland in terms of gameplay. It resembles something you'd expect to see in much older titles. Yeah. And looking at people playing later into the game, it really doesn't look like it changes up the gameplay at all as well. It's that same kind of just mix of sneak and platforming elements. Well, I mean, in a Golem game, what more can you really do? Unless you wanted to incorporate some puzzles in there or something. He's not a fighter. Yeah, I think puzzles would be good, but he's yeah. also a manipulator as well. And even though there are That's kind true. of dialogue options and things like that in the game, a lot of them kind of result to, do you be a nice Smeagol or do you be a nasty Golem sort of thing? Or, oh, or perhaps yeah. it's the other way around. I'm not quite sure on that point. But it's kind of very surface level type dialogue yeah. decisions that you make. It doesn't have any real, real, real implications. I do understand that there actually are various endings to this game as well. So I'd right. be interested to at least hear where they go and what they do with that, considering that there is an established canon law yeah. to what goes on there. So I'd be interesting to see just how far they take that. So it does seem like a lot of the gameplay around this centers around sneaking around orcs and various kind of prison looking environments I've noticed. You seem to be interacting with a few prisoners as you skulk around and creep through various tunnels and grapple ledges and things. Apparently, you even actually get to meet, uh, and you know, a kind of uh, an early Sauron as well, which uh, which sounds interesting. Yeah, so there there is law specific elements of this game that I'm quite interested by. However, looking at the gameplay footage, this is absolutely one that I think I'll just kick back and watch a playthrough, maybe oh, yeah. a little cutscene compilation. You know, <laughs> I'll probably just read about it. Honestly, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if I want to watch a cutscene with that character model in it. Some of the character models, speaking of that, look really, really low effort as well. There's uh, like a kind of a, a, an old bearded dude that I've seen That's and as Gandalf, he speaks mate. is that actually supposed to be I Gandalf I, would, I, no I, did, <laughs> I, I wondered if it was supposed to be a wizard because he's got like just such a long white beard but I noticed that his entire beard moves with his jawline so it's that kind of animation oh. that I would expect to see in a game made by a much much lower budget studio and it's very off-putting and just makes you think that you're looking at a PlayStation 2 game or something like that it's not unacceptable but it's just a bit like like you say with that budget that went into that it's a little job jarring to see yeah. in a modern game i've got to say unless there's a specific stylized element going on there which i really don't see in this title don't put the word style anywhere near it as far as i'm concerned also really questionably they've actually locked very standard content behind stupid paywalls with exclusive editions of the game available for purchase it ruins it yeah, I th did, did we cover this a little bit when it was first sort of came out? We did. There were some concerns around this, and it looks like they're fully delivered on that. I mean, <laughs> this paywalled content includes things like the game law compendium. What? So something that you're very <laughs> used to just having as a standard menu item in so many other games. Yeah, that thing that, that reminds you of the story that you're doing. Yeah. In case yeah. you forget, because you And kind of like characters and enemies and things like that yeah. that you need a bit of a recap on. If you Nope, got to buy the exclusive edition, baby. Oh, that is f up, man. That is really Not only bad. that, but there are also Gollum specific emotes that uh, that are locked behind that. In this single player game, there are yeah. there are emotes that are locked. One of these includes one where he swats at a fly, falls over, and shits himself. Really? I wish I was joking. How much are they paying for charging for that? A couple of quids? <laughs> <laughs> no, that is all content that is exclusively locked behind the larger tiers of the game. Oh, so if you're so you can't into buying buy that, it separate. I haven't heard news of that, to my yeah. knowledge, that that's available. I think that this is kind of exclusive, higher tier, oh, buy the exclusive yeah. edition content. Slimy. That's yeah. really bad, yeah. And the fact that, again, that they're marketing emotes for a single-player game, exactly. to me, that's is just really weird. There's a level of exclusivity there that, frankly, I think they really overestimated anyone giving a shit about. That's just nonsense, isn't it? And to top it all off as well, well, I'm hearing plenty of news of performance related issues, uh -huh. visual glitches, and various crashes as well. So they have gone for the yeah. absolute medley of fuckery with this release. And uh, I look forward to not hearing about this game in the next. <laughs> 
week's time, I guess. <laughs> but you know what the most damning thing I read about this was? And it, and it wasn't just like a one-off comment. It was sort of across the internet. Apparently, this is worse than Redfall. Given what I've that read about it, it today, that doesn't surprise me at all. So, uh, God, I think that's enough uh, tearing into the Lord of the Rings Gollum <laughs> yeah. game with uh, that bad taste out of our mouth. Need a little pick-me-up, mate. Yeah, a little palate cleanser, James. Let's move on to the PlayStation Showcase 2023. Yeah, another thing that didn't go down particularly well with the people. <laughs> yeah, so I've seen a lot of criticism that this wasn't a particularly event-filled showcase. Uh, although i got to say, I did watch the whole thing through myself, and there was a lot of titles releasing here, albeit your typical slew of maybe a good sort of 30 plus percent of them being smaller indie titles yeah. that will always appeal to a certain audience but me personally i wasn't really invested in any of those i suppose the only one that uh, we talked a little bit about before the pod and is probably worth mentioning is cat quest pirates of the Caribbean. so uh, that is one that i am completely unfamiliar with james but why don't you give the listeners a bit of a lowdown well there's not too much of a lowdown i can give really i did play cat quest 2 because it was on games pass okay i'm pretty yeah, sure, yeah. I'm pretty sure good a reason as pass. any to play cat quest too. yeah so why not and uh it was quite a fun little sort of role play game you're not gonna spend lo- well i say you're not you might do I-, I personally wouldn't spend loads of hours in it but for two three hours it was a fun little run just you know go around is it kind of like puzzles fighting uh, it's it's very kind of cute you'd see 2d art style isn't it it's not even 2d really it's oh it's, is it not it's got like an over like think about old school final fantasy games or jrpgs where you've got an overworld and you walk you're running across the overworld with like your two characters and, and yeah from memory it's it was um kind of jrpg style combat so like the enemies would flash up and then you'd go into a separate combat screen where it's like select fight select like attack magic. choose your yeah. fight move oh, okay cool okay yeah, so, cool. so it's, it's quite a fun little game so that, that's quite cool the name is hilariously awful of Pirates course, of the yeah. Caribbean. Surely they could have come up with something better than that. I'm not about to put the pressure on myself to do that on the spot no. right now. No, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> there was like a brief pause there where I saw James's head work overtime. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> can I think of something quickly that's better? No, I mean, it, it's awful, but it's good awful. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's <laughs> yeah, sort of- yeah, I'm here for it. Also, as part of this showcase, we got a glimpse into a few new PlayStation games. So I'll just go through a few of the more notable ones, according to me. (laughs) Uh, This is a a will list. That's a very good source, I hear. Fair Games looks like a pretty interesting title there. It kind of looked to me a little bit like I was getting Brink vibes from this, honestly. It looks like there's team-based kind of assault. You see a group of futuristic-looking hipsters attack what looks like a heavily guarded (laughs) house party. Honestly, that's... <laughs> paradoxical sentence anyone's ever said some futuristic looking hipsters the yeah, retro guys yeah. but futuristic Hell yeah, yeah they're kind of like i don't know what would you describe that as neon hipster I yeah, think that's, is, yeah, yeah 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 that's fair comment yeah We see there, we see kind of gunfights break out during the assault. We see them using various equipment. This makes me think, is this game going to play a little bit like Payday in terms of the fact this is going to be a team-based thing where you're taking on AI? Is this going to be more of a Brink thing, as I mentioned earlier, where we're going to have kind of objective-based combat with various teams contributing to that? Who knows? Uh, The footage of this was pretty much all pre-rendered gameplay, (laughs) so we really don't get very much information on that. But uh, my interests were piqued there, I got to say. Who knows? knows it'll probably be a show yeah but you know something to be excited about potentially fans of the starship trooper series will also be interested perhaps by hell divers 2 where the original was actually a twin stick shooter however hell divers 2 seems to have taken a new direction and now it's a kind of over the shoulder third person shooter a la <laughs> something a little bit like earth defense force i thought i was hoping you were gonna be like and they've got a slightly different turn now it's now a f-ing puzzle game <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's now a goddamn over the head tactical RTS. Yeah, to be fair, that would probably be pretty badass. Uh, I mean, Halo did it, it worked. Yeah. So, this title is very reminiscent of Starship Troopers in terms of the whole kind of it looks like a very militarized advert for it, telling you to enlist today, sort of thing. Join the mobile infantry and save the world. Service guarantees citizenship. The creatures in it and the bugs heavily resemble the insects that you see throughout the Starship Trooper movies. And honestly, this game looked like quite a bit of fun to play with a group of mates. Uh, But I thought it was worth a mention there because it definitely tickled my fancy in terms of... uh, I'm a big fan of the uh, Starship Troopers movie, particularly the first one. 
So I think that uh, I would definitely be more leaning towards giving that one a go. Yeah, and you liked Earth Defense Force, and what you just said there sounds exactly like Earth Defense Force. It does, with a little bit more of kind of building gadgets and things like that. It looks like you can build structures that do little traps and things, so the gameplay looks a little bit more involved there. i got to say, looking at it, I think I might ultimately still prefer to go back to Earth Defense Force, just Fair. based on the glimpse that I saw. But, you know, yeah, this is definitely worth a little bit of a further look on my part anyway. I'll just rip through a few more of the other titles that we saw. So fans of uh, the original Ghost Runner game will be excited to see the announcement of Ghost Runner 2, now featuring a motorbike. So those silky smooth action segments are going to be even further amplified by the use of a motorbike there. Very nice too. Fans of Journey will be pleased to see that the creators of that game have released Sword of the Sea, which again looks like a very similar game to Journey. Although this time it looks like like your kind of main method of traversal is using a sort of sand surfboard type thing. Okay. Looks pretty interesting. Yeah, Journey's one I've been meaning to check out because apparently it's super therapeutic. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's what I've always thought from some of the gameplay footage that I've seen as well. And uh, again, this looks like exactly that type of game with a very similar art style as well. Lots yeah. of bright colours and calming palettes. See, when I see the name Sword of the Sea with the creators of Journey, I'm thinking similar sort of thing, but on a boat. How relaxing would that be, man? That sounds cool. That is definitely worth a little further look absolutely moving on it also looks like square enix have had a go at making a splatoon title by the name (laughs) of foam stars this was very intriguing yeah i read about this one it's got a very similar style of attitude as well to splatoon although with a slightly less kind of cartoony childish aesthetic it is still very bright attractive and colorful yeah looked like it could be quite a bit of fun will it be popular that's another matter (laughs) yeah. <laughs> another Square Enix title we also got more of a glimpse into Final Fantasy 16 we saw a title that resembles kind of like a slightly more detailed Minecraft with a lot of destruction based physics in the game Teardown yeah. that looks like a you know a fun game but also I do have to query I feel like we've already kind of nailed pretty good destruction physics in other <laughs> yeah, titles yeah. why are we going back to the kind of stylized pixelized thing I feel like obviously you could say it's an artistic choice but a lot of the time much like Minecraft I feel like the choice to do that is mostly based on mitigating the fact that the game is going to have to have a lot of things going on it that would be very hard to replicate in anything that resembled photorealism. So they go for a more simplified art style. However, I've got to say, we're kind of there with destruction these days on things. Why do the pixel thing? I don't get it. Uh, So moving swiftly on, we also got another look at something relevant to another title that we've discussed in its early stages on the podcast before. We got a glimpse at Bungie's Marathon. Yet again, another pre-rendered trailer. However, we did get an idea of what the world will look like and predictably it looks very much like a kind of sci-fi destiny halo style world no some pretty cool never scenery. that's not what it can't be we saw some kind of like exploded planets i think with a ship suspended in between it a lot of very cool sci-fi imagery and uh who knows what that will actually turn out to be but it's nice to get a bit of a confirmation there as we spoke about before that bungie were getting behind this new multiplayer thing and even potentially is this going to rival something that microsoft might have in the works even potentially call of duty Mm. who knows watch this space guys (laughs) the other one that's a big old watch this space in my opinion is assassin's creed mirage uh, they, they... Are you quite keen on that one, are you? No, I'm not. Oh, no? Okay. But purely on the basis that if I can't finish Odyssey, there's no way, I, there's no point in me getting another one, right? I haven't. I think I started playing Odyssey in, what, January of this year? I tried to do a second time. I haven't played it since. So, you know, I can't justify being excited for Mirage when I can't even do Odyssey. But I give it a shout out. It looks like it's going to be okay but they really need it to be great the aesthetic intrigued me because it looked like they're taking a little bit more of a step back towards the original look of altair in the original assassin's creed and that was the kind of thing that got me going a little bit more assassin's creed has gone through many developments and changes throughout the years and it barely resembles the original title at all now so interesting to see that they're actually kind of taking a step back there my understanding that this one actually takes place in 9th century baghdad and i agree it's interesting to see it's either going to be a master stroke or it's them trying to pull at the nostalgia strings as a last ditch attempt and i'm uh, curious to see how it goes i'm leaning that it might be the latter because i i, I sensed what was happening to me when i was yeah. watching that footage I was like oh i know yeah. what you're doing you slimy or you even said it just then you're like oh it's altia yeah exactly yeah, yeah. They, they know what they're doing you know i know what you're doing right now mm. and i don't like it yeah okay so swiftly moving on to some of the most noticeable titles that i yes. picked out during this showcase and there's one that i'm super excited about in this list that I can't wait for you to get to. Would it happen to be Phantom Blade Zero? It is Phantom Blade Zero. That game looks f***ing awesome. So cool, doesn't it? You can definitely tell where the kind of 
influences have come from there. There's more than a splash of Sekiro, let's just say. Yeah, a bit of Sekiro. The fighting sequences in the game looked really, really cool, especially the bits where you're fighting multiple enemies at once. Yeah, some of the martial arts combos and poses, it seems like you can do, look sick. I really like that. I really like the fact that a lot of your moves are based around attacking multiple enemies at once yeah. in terms of you see him kind of do a leg stab and an arm stab yeah. in opposite directions. That's really cool. Looking like yoga poses and shit. It's so cool. The way that you block attacks, I'm really interested to see just how that works because it looks like when you do see some of the gameplay, your character is just being attacked by an absolute flurry of blows and I'll be interested to see how that quite works. I do get a big sense that there is a lot of HUD and perhaps even QTE stuff that's going on on the screen that we're not actually seeing in the trailer. Often they like to do that. They like to kind of strip everything yeah. back and keep it as cinematic as possible whereas absolutely I'm envisaging seeing some sort of pulsing X or A button or something like that on the screen to kind of, oh I assume it's a PlayStation showcase. We're probably yeah. talking X's here. It looked fast. It looked furious. It had a lot of what resembled kind of like Asian mythology stuff going on there which yeah. looked really cool. And it looks kind of dark and sort of broody doesn't it as well. The dragon looked absolutely badass. It looked yeah. like a kind of a Chinese celebration style festive dragon but it was obviously a living creature underneath and yeah. that looked creepy as. Honestly after watching some of this I did start looking back into Wo Long again. I was like oh, yeah, I need something to scratch my itch until this is out <laughs> and uh, actually Wo Long might be the uh, the cure for the itch before we see the release of Phantom Blade Zero. However is it coming out on PC? Do we know that yet? I don't know. That's the only thing and that's why I'm sort of tempering my excitement a little bit at this stage. I'd like to think so but that is that just me being a jabroni? You keep using this word jabroni and it's awesome james i am pleased to confirm that phantom played zero does appear to be coming out for pc as well as playstation 5 ah rejoice hallelujah excellent thank sorry, you sorry xbox Jim. I've, 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 I've I left watched... them behind now. <laughs> <laughs> you literally couldn't give a shit now about this yeah. Activision acquisition. This is all about Phantom Blade now. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine paying $500 for a console and you can't even play shit. Bethesda, Bethesda, who? <laughs> it's all about Phantom Blade, baby. Yeah, some PC, bitch. <laughs> yeah, it really, it, Phantom Blade did take away, f it, it made me feel much better about the fact they didn't announce the Bloodborne PC port. Yes, I mean, they are going to obviously be very different games, but this is a, yeah. a very meaningful distraction, I think, away from it. It looks like a, a mixture of samurai and ninja style gameplay yeah, in terms bad, of, uh, there is katanas, but then there's also sort of smaller weapons as well that it looks like you can use. I didn't get to see much in terms of the character customization. It looked a lot of the time that you're playing the same player. Yeah. However, I made that assumption about Wo Long, and it turns out that there was a pretty decent character customization in that. So honestly, we just have to wait to see more about this game. But initial indications, this game is polling very high in terms of what I was excited about. Yeah, you and me both, my friend. This was the one that I'm really coming away from thinking, okay, this could be cool. And the fact you just told me that it's almost certainly coming to PC, that's... Uh pretty sweet i know there's a game that you're probably looking forward to a little bit more than this one on this list but for me this one was wow i need to play this as soon as it comes out this could be a day one -er for me if it's on pc i'm not gonna lie no i'm right yeah. there with you man but as you've alluded to there there is another title on this list that i am very excited to talk about so let's yeah. move on listeners have three guesses and see if you can guess what it is so what i am of course talking about the announcement of the metal gear solid snake eater remake Very good reveal trailer there. I did get initial vibes immediately after seeing the green para, I can't lie. Yeah. I have since watched the trailer over and over again, and I have actually noticed that in the background you can actually see like a dark shape that vaguely resembles what could be the Shagahod being carried by four separate helicopters really? in the scene where you see the para flying over as well. So there is a lot of kind of, before you get the big reveal of Snake coming out of the water, you do get a lot of hints in terms of what the game could be before then. Obviously the electric fence that the para has to fly through just before that is obviously another big indicator as well because it's really reminiscent of one of the areas in the game. They have released some screenshots to go alongside it where you see a little bit of a glimpse of an environment. You get to see one of the crocodiles in actual gameplay terms. However, I think given that we're seeing so little of this game right now, I think that that definitely does suggest that we're a ways off seeing it. And as a way of placating fans, they have actually released the Metal Gear Master Collection or something <laughs> to the tune of that. Volume 1, which includes the original Metal Gear Solid, Metal Gear Solid 2, and 
and Metal Gear Solid 3 as well, which will be great to play on a PlayStation 5. And I'm hoping to see that actually release on PC as well, which I think it is due to do. That would be wicked. Yeah, it would be so good to finally be able to play Metal Gear without doing any tricky emulation or actually having to go out and find a secondhand copy of like a 1998 Metal Gear Solid <laughs> yeah, exactly. PC release, you know? So very excited about the prospect of both of those things. Although, I mean, given the love that Konami has historically kind of shown to the Metal Gear series, I'd be interesting to see how this gets handled. Although I believe it's actually Bluepoint that are looking after this remaster. So there's definitely a strong pedigree there in terms of what they'll be able to do with this, I hope. I was glad that you brought this up because I was going to ask you what your opinion was knowing that this remaster was being done almost certainly with no Im input from Kojima because that's obviously a big thing that makes the game great. Do you have any concerns about that or do you think it will be done faithfully by Konami and potentially Bluepoint or whoever else is going to look into it? I really hope that they take a note out of the Resident Evil 4 remake and I kind of feel like this is part of the reason why things like this are starting to happen. I think that Capcom has really led the way for just how good certain remakes can be and I think that hopefully Konami has been taking note of that and they'll actually implement a lot of that faithfulness to the original titles along with some innovation where it's needed I mean I, I don't really want to be going back and playing that old familiar control scheme from Metal Gear Solid <laughs> Snake Eater if I'm honest well one thing that is going to be familiar which I read about is they are going to use the same voice actors oh so they're actually going to use David Hayter as the voice well that is that is uh very good you're pretty good I think that that will go a very long way in terms of selling this game because honestly if they were to change up those voice actors particularly in terms of Snake it wouldn't go down well. It would be even worse than the uh, Keith the Sutherland sudden replacement in Phantom Pain and Ground Zeroes. Well, I can't speak for exactly which characters it is but I did see the the article that the original voice actors are going to be used. I have to imagine it's going to be David Hayter. It has to be. Like yeah. They're not just going to say oh yeah we've got the original Vulcan but that's it. <laughs> yeah you know, it's like no, no you need snake you need boss like you know they all need to be the original voices don't get rid of any of the silliness please i want all of that stuff yeah. remaining in the game it needs to have the exact same feel and tone of the originals i don't even think it needs to have the same kind of shift that the resident evil 4 remake had where although it's still goofy it's in a goofy different way i think that they really need to for this first release nail this one on the head if we're going to have any faith of seeing a future metal gear solid 1 remake which i would love to see who knows have to keep that big ass ladder in there too. So much of the DNA in Metal Gear is influenced by Kojima bullshit. So I think that by getting rid of any of that, you would really be toying with the kind of the recipe for the formula overall. I I, I would go as far as to say you would be completely f***ing with it. Having played Death Stranding, you couldn't take the Kojima bollocks out of Death Stranding. It would be a completely different game. Exactly. I've actually played Snake. We actually completed Snake Eater together, sort of passing the controller back and forth. You can't take the Kojima bollocks out of that game either. I completely agree. But I think that's enough gushing about the Metal Gear series from me. Let's move on to just a very quick shout out to the last two titles on my list. Alan Wake 2 and Dragon's Dogma 2. So Alan Wake was a title that I never actually played the original of. However, looking at some of the gameplay for this looked very intriguing. It definitely looks like it's got a pretty strong update in terms of graphics and the way that the gunplay works in the game and looks like a pretty sturdy horror game. Yep, I've seen the first one, um, but never played it and I've not actually seen any of the second one, so I can't comment, unfortunately. But I know that it's one that's been looking looked forward to from the fan base for quite a long time. So I hope it's good for them. Yeah, absolutely. And as a newcomer to the series myself you know me i just like a good horror game and yeah. this looked like it had some promise there so yeah absolutely willing to give that some more of my time later on nice nice other than that dragman's dogma 2 is another game so the original title is one that has been in my list to play for a long long time and it's been gathering dust on my shelf <laughs> however seeing this update has definitely given me i think that final kick up the arse to finally crack on and play dragon's dogma 1 from my understanding it's got a multiplayer element james so i'm definitely taking you along on this journey at some point please Please do. I've tried to play this game multiple times. I've bought it on about five different consoles and uh, yeah, I'd, it's really good fun and some of the mechanics in it are really cool, but there's one system in it, the porn system, that I just can't get my head around properly. Yeah, and... doing all that sex all the time, it's just no. so much sex, you know, no. too much sex. I should clarify, porn is in a chess piece porn, like P-A-W-N. <laughs> oh, right. Uh, yes, oh man, if course, there was a porn mechanic like P-O-R-N, oh man, I'd never have stopped playing it. Ha, 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 ha,
But no, it, but it is, it is a really cool game. It's kind of hack and slashy, soulsy sort of fantasy game. Really good fun. Yeah, with a lot of versatility in terms of the class systems as well. Yeah. From my memory, you could actually make some pretty unique class combinations like a mage archer and stuff like that, which is stuff that you don't often see in other games. I never really looked at that far into that side of it. I know that you can dual class and stuff, but I uh, can't really comment. But uh, I agree with you. The announcement of a second one and sort of more concrete information on it might give me the kick up the arse I need to play the first one. I have got it on the PC, so who knows? So something would be amiss if I didn't mention how PlayStation rounded off their showcase with a very long look at the gameplay footage for Spider-Man 2. So I've seen a lot of people whiling out on the internet about the gameplay for this. It looks like it's featuring quite a few significant updates to the combat system. When you play as Peter Parker, he is now using the symbiote Spider-Man suit, so his combat abilities are now massively increased. I've seen all sorts of various giant fist powers that he can do. Oh, he wow. can kind of more for himself during the fight to attack multiple people. Looks very, very promising. I never played Miles Morales, but I did play the original title. I had a great time with that. I really liked the direction that they were taking Miles Morales, and it looks like Spider-Man 2, you get to play as both. So there is going to be a bunch of fun gameplay and cool set pieces that I'm looking forward to checking out at some point when this game probably finally makes its way to PC. So three years after it comes out on PlayStation. Hell yeah. Based on this showcase, PlayStation do seem like they're doing a better job of releasing parity on the PC at the same time, so I've got my fingers crossed that we'll hear about a PC announcement soon. Fingers crossed, mate. And with that, let's move on to our final article of the day. PlayStation, as part of their showcase, also announces a streaming handheld device, Project Q. Surely a code name. Hopefully that's not the actual name. Yeah, that is definitely, that's <laughs> the, uh, as I'll go on to clarify later, yeah. that is the internal name yeah, currently for the device. As of yet, title in working order, I imagine. This was actually another topic that we covered on an earlier episode of the podcast. James and I have talked before about Sony's plans of developing a handheld video game streaming device, but now we've actually finally got a look at the new Sony project, internally titled Project Q, as part of the PlayStation Showcase 2023. This new device resembles a PlayStation 5 controller split down the middle with a Switch-style screen in between two ends. The screen is actually 8 inches, which is an inch larger than Nintendo's Switch OLED model. <laughs> And according to the announcement at the PlayStation Showcase, the device will feature all of the features of the PS5's DualSense controller. So in terms of all those features, I take that to mean that all of the advanced rumble and haptic feedback features that are currently unique to the PS5 will shortly be coming to whatever they actually end up naming their currently titled Project Q. We can but hope. It would be pretty poor if they didn't. A lot of me does think, just how much do I actually want all of that haptic sh** going on on a handheld console? I gotta be honest, I actually turn off a lot of the vibration and high sense vibration stuff that the Switch has going on while I'm playing it because I just feel weird about having a screen so close to something that's vibrating quite heavily. Yeah, but when you say it's um, like basically a PS5 controller, I'm imagining something quite thick and robust that could hack it. And when I think of the haptic stuff, I guess I'm thinking more of like the triggers that react to The trigger pull, yeah, yeah. Like that stuff on a handheld would be fine. I, I kind of agree with you on vibration. I always turn that off as well. The announcement was pretty non-specific, stating that the device will release later this year and that we'd hear more in the near future, although I've already heard rumours that November is likely the month of release for this new device. Which makes perfect sense, just in time for Christmas. Exactly, absolutely, yeah. Other religious holidays are available. Okay, so with coverage of that out of the way, that is truly the end of our news section this week. It's time to move on to Completionist Corner. Here we go for the Completionist's Corner. Following the events last week where our characters, Solid Snake and Nigensei, along with their crew of vampiric revenants, discovered that we need to use our special powers to defeat and quell a total of five successors who were revenants transformed by amoral experiments performed by a scientist called Juzo Mido. Our mission now is to quell the relics of the defeated successors and put a stop to Mido's evil plans. Having defeated three successors already in last week's episode, we need to head to the Crown of Sand to find Eva and the success of the throat. Very attractive name. And yes, as we sort of get to the crown of uh, the crown of sand, uh, Jack is waiting for us there, and we get a little monologue from him, basically echoing that sentiment. So off we set. And this area is kind of a sandy area, not very deserty. 
still looking kind of like a destroyed city around, yeah. but there's just a lot of sand everywhere now as well. Exactly. And this what this sand does is um, when you walk in heavily sort of strewn sand bits, if you like, it acts partially quick sandy. You sink to a certain bit, but I think that's just an aesthetic choice. Yeah, I don't think you can actually die from sinking into it. No, I don't think so too. I've not stood there long enough to test it, but I don't think you can. But the other thing it does is it starts to inflict the leak debuff on you, which basically drains your ichor. When it's really heavy, when it's heavy, like the lighter sort of layers is fine because you walk on that but you know when it sort of comes up to your shin slightly i had only noticed that that was just impacting my dodge speed and things which obviously is expecting you know when you're in kind of knee deep sand yeah i hadn't actually realized that that actually drains your icker as well uh i yeah. thought it was just the enemies in the area that you're fighting were inflicting that status but so i guess i was getting out from the sand as well yeah, yeah. right okay well good to know for the next run of this game <laughs> yeah no this um the enemy that does it to you the most is the sort of sand blob that hides in that sand oh Oh, yes yeah, yeah i'm familiar with those guys yeah they're kind of they're similar to some of the blobby enemies that you find earlier on in the game these are just kind of sand variants of them it's a reskinned poison blob from the start of the game yeah but that's right yeah i'm here for it though yeah it's i mean yeah, yeah i'd be lying <laughs> if i said that we don't get very similar stuff in some of the other games that we enjoy although there is plenty of enemy variation in this game much like some of the souls enemies as well you can kind of tell what they're modeled off of that yeah, their yeah. attacks are fairly similar although they do have a few unique moves a lot of them are kind of variations of the same thing that's a fair comment a dog enemy is always a dog enemy exactly. it always does the same thing exactly. oh you're gonna pounce at me and then attack me way too quickly yeah okay nice yep yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So after travelling through this area and battling various monsters, we finally arrive at the boss arena. We find Eva, one of our crew, in the apparent embrace of an angel-looking statue. Jack, who of course is a dear friend of Eva's, yeah, dear friend. I reckon they were lovers still. Yeah, I gotta say, after some of the events of this, I take back my statement that they yeah. were brother and sister. I, I think that this is definitely <laughs> more of a romantic entanglement. Yeah. yeah, I agree. But nonetheless, Jack, who is also a member of our gang, attempts to end her life and put her out of her misery, but is stopped by our character. At that moment the angel awakens and the boss fight begins in the middle of a sand strewn arena and this sand doesn't inflict the debuff the arena sand boss lady's sand though <laughs> hell yeah she does and yeah. she has got a lot of spinny kicking up sand attacks that you need to avoid but no man what did you think of this boss big sandy hands and f***ing loads of attacks that hit you from behind honestly this one wasn't too bad although in some of the latter parts of it when she starts to get a bit aggro in the second stage i did spend most of my time dodging these attacks and yeah. really it was Yakimo that actually finished her off <laughs> as we'll get into a little bit later in the playthrough let's just say I wasn't particularly optimized at this point so Yakimo was definitely uh, the more damage dealing functioning member of the party and I was kind of the support role buffer and then I guess sometimes at worst just moral support really yeah, I was well, cheering him on well given what I know you're talking about there which we'll get into later you were just giving moral support at this point you were seriously handicapped Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I agree. This boss um, has some annoying attacks and can get a bit hectic at times, but not massively difficult. I was once again able to first time this boss. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. I first timed fun. it the first time I played as well. Just two big we big weapons hitting her constantly because I also use Yakimo and obviously I use a big hammer. So <laughs> <laughs> Next! So we defeat the dusty demonic angel boss and absorb the large relic and see a memory of Eva's, which is a normal event following our character absorbing a relic from a defeated successor. Those damn blue pineapples. This memory explains a little how Eva first met Jack and how their relationship developed to the point of her helping him to monitor and mercy kill successors whenever they became frenzied. In this vision, at the moment they met, Eva had fallen on hard times and Jack took her in. She began to use her voice, given to her by Jack, to aid him in soothing the successors and keeping them from frenzying. She does have a lovely voice as well. The crew then see Eva in a touching vision where she says farewell to Jack, singing a little ditty, and accepting her fate as a successor and eventually passing on because I'm guessing that we both just walked off and didn't fix her. We did, yeah. So yeah. at this point in the game, I was restoring the vestiges or the vestiges whenever I was actually able to. However, at this point, we were both locked in to the uh, the kind of neutral ending, I suppose, given yeah. that we had saved some, but we hadn't saved all. Yeah, and my character, I, I got all the vestiges. I just f***ed her off. Just didn't save her. <laughs> By this point, my character's pretty much succumbed to the corruption. Fully corrupted. Yeah. Nice. But, you know, is that permanent? 
We'll find out later in the story. Our newly bereaved Jack then vows to go after Mido, guessing that his ultimate plan is to revive the Queen after he takes Silver's powerful relic. If you remember from last week, Gregorio Silver was a soldier before the Great Collapse who was brought back from death to be a revenant. After defeating the Queen alongside our character all that time ago, he became the successor of the Brain. That's right. Silver's the successor too. Jack tells us that Silver was also the one who created the red mist surrounding the city and trapped the revenants inside. More on that later. Jack also explains that, as we know, revenants were created to swell the ranks against the Queen. However, without the Red Mist, Revenants and the Lost would be free to roam and the outside world would be lost. It's now time to hunt Mido down and stop him from causing more chaos. We follow Jack and head to the Crypt Spire. So the Crypt Spire is kind of a tower, basically. Yeah, you're kind of looking through the innards of a tower, travelling your way up large circular pillars connected by walkways and stairs, I guess. Yeah, and it's in terms of decor, it's not too dissimilar to the Cathedral of the Sacred Blood, but it's... No, it's that's Instead of bright white, it's kind of an incredibly dark grey, almost black. Black, corrupted style, yeah. yeah. And thankfully, much, much less walkways and architectural inconsistencies. Yeah, it's much more vertical and it's sort of empty space around you because you're in a hollowed out tower and that just makes all the difference. It's a little bit more linear as well. It all helps. As long as we're not going back to that cathedral, <laughs> I'm all good. And most of the enemies in this area are kind of a mixture of Mido's guards as well as some assorted lost enemies as well. Yes, and a lot of Mido's guards carry special black weapons that are just pretty useful. They're very powerful, have some cool combinations on them. Shout outs to the, the Black Greatsword. I don't think I was lucky enough to get any useful drops there. I was hoping for a black bayonet, but uh, alas. Yeah, it's a shame because they're, they're, it's good fun. Maybe next time. We'll see. I'll, I am looking forward to hitting up the new game plus at this at some point. So we fight off a bunch of Lost and Mido's guards and even manage to save one of Silver's men as we fight through the Crypt Spire to get to Mido. We navigate through the land of a thousand levers. That's very apt. Yeah, fight. there is a <laughs> lot of levers and a lot of doors. A lot in this of keys area. to collect, a lot of levers. Thankfully, not so many keys as levers. There's a lot of levers that just yeah. open the door, thank yeah. God. But uh, yeah, there are quite a few where you typically have to defeat a quite tough boss in that area before they'll drop the key for the door to open. Yeah, we should, we should say mini boss, really. Not like a boss boss. Oh yeah, yeah. Big mob. They are very much a mini boss, like yeah. a tough, tough mob. Gave me a little bit of Bloodborne vibes as well, actually. It made me think of Mikkel Ash's tower somehow. I don't quite see that, but I, it's dark and gloomy, so I can sort of, you know, I can get behind that, yeah. But no, so fighting our way past yet more of Mido's guards and finally arriving at the top of the spire, we see what looks like a slumbering angelic-looking lady next to another sleeping demon. But we also see a guarded Mido in the distance, up to no good. And when we say guarded, he has sort of like three bodyguards around him, like when he, we first met him. That's right, yeah. yeah. He's always got a posse. But before we can stop him he actually revives both of the dormant enemies that we were just talking about there before walking off yet again mumbling some nonsense about how we hoped that we enjoyed the starter and this is now the main course got a weird food obsession that guy yeah mental absolute madman and here starts one of the toughest if not the toughest in fact undoubtedly the toughest boss fight of this game the cannoneer and the blade bearer yeah. james i noticed that you've uh you've just put the word uh next to them in brackets yeah. it's very apt very apt yeah yes. these bastards up to this point i had first timed every single boss minus when we played together in our co-op run but in my single player run i first timed every boss i lost that record here these bastards imagine ornstein and smo but way way worse where one of them does an ability where it actually automatically targets both of you irrespective of where you're standing in the arena and then does lingering fire damage yeah and couple that if anyone has played dark souls and knows the ornstein and smell fight you know that attack where ornstein just rushes across the room with his spear yeah imagine that but it can go through pillars yeah there's an added projectile at the end of the attack as well that can travel through things just to get you when you think you're safe yeah and but... also coupled with that there's also a very broken hitbox on the flame cast ability which just forces you to back dodge that is very deceptive even though it doesn't look like you're getting hit by the flames you're getting hit by the flames tough one tough one tough tough boss fight this one took me countless turns i definitely wasn't able to keep track of the amount of turns I spent kind of like the latter half of one evening trying to do this fight before putting it down 
picked it up the next day, chucked a few more attempts into it, had to put it down again. <laughs> and it wasn't until the following day I finally managed to do this one. And uh, honestly, the sense of relief was huge. Yeah, and just for, you know, a little peek behind the curtain, when he finally did it, he messaged me with just like all caps, just ranting about how much he hated this boss. Let me bring up the text. I'll read it verbatim. <laughs> those fucking duos cannoneer blade wielding pieces of fucking sh oh my god damn diggity dog they're fucking annoying goddamn dodgy as f flamethrower hitboxes and double lingering owie explosion motherfuckers <laughs> <laughs> it was i just had to get it out yeah <laughs> i i had no one else to kind of like commiserate with me on uh on just the struggles <laughs> of that i knew no one else would understand so yeah. i had to get it out somehow and i felt and, uh, it i felt it <laughs> Oh man, yeah, the first time I fought these guys, uh, it took me forever. This is actually what made me put the game down, and I didn't play it again for like six months. <laughs> this almost, it wasn't quite as bad as your Godskin duo, but... Uh... No, it was worse than Godskin duo. It was worse than <laughs> yeah. Godskin duo. Godskin duo was only like a month. Oh right, okay, okay, yeah. But it's, it's those duos, man, isn't it? They yeah. are tough. They break you. If Ornstein and Smo, I've, I don't think I've ever lost to. That's, I've not, heard no, that's of... bullshit. I have lost. I haven't lost them recently, but I lost them those when I first did it. Some people even might say that this is a bit of like a kind of a rip-off concept, although that the idea of a duo boss fight is hardly unique to the Soul series. Nah, but the but the bigger one and the smaller one. The bigger one and the smaller one yeah. definitely has a bit more of a resemblance. But again, I mean, is that trope really unique to the Soul series of having like a big, heavy, fat boss and a skinny, much more agile one? I think that no, I don't. It think definitely so, goes much fair. deeper than that as well. Yeah. That said, this is as we've both said, there a much more challenging boss fight than the Onstein and Smo one. I yeah. tried various different tactics in terms of which one to attack first. Do you go for both of them at the same time? Do you try and fin down the herd? Do you go for the cannoneer first? Do you go for the blade bearer first? In the yeah. end, I found that the tactic that worked for me the best was attacking the blade bearer and then kiting them as close to Yakimo whenever I could so I could kind of get him to deal as much damage. And then just praying that together we were able to take down the blade bearer fast enough so that you're just left with the one remaining attack. Attacker. And I think we're both like-minded in the sense that we think that the Cannoneer is much easier to deal with solo than the Blade Bearer is. Comfortably. It's not even close. And I agree with that way of doing it. You can manipulate the AI a little bit. For whatever reason, they will just switch who they're attacking because typically one will attack you and one will attack your partner. And randomly they'll just switch. Even if they're in like the middle of being hit, they'll just turn around and you can get a couple more hits in before they turn back around realizing that they're idiots. You get some pretty good windows for attack using the kind of aggro switching that seems to happen pretty randomly. Yeah, it's, it is super random. There's no rhyme or reason to it. And the other thing you can use to your advantage is um, the blade bearer is an ice elemental character and the cannoneer is fire you can equip the opposite one to do extra damage to each if you make your weapons fire weapons with a gift then you'll do a lot more damage to the blade bearer and if you use ice weapons a lot more damage to the cannoneer so you can sort of use little things like that to help you along but there is still a lot of bullshit in this fight and the arena's not small but it feels quite small when you're sort of trying to avoid a lot of these attacks because they've got serious range on them particularly the blade bearers yeah the the cannoneer has a lot of ranged attacks that can hit you quite fast and as I mentioned, irrespective of where you are in the arena in some cases. However, the Blade Bearer just has so much mobility that you can go from having all the space in the world to feeling absolutely cornered yeah. within a matter of seconds. And if you do get cornered, it's over. You're not going to be able to dodge or block all of her combos. She's too quick. Very, very quick yeah. indeed. Yeah, no, this, as I say, these guys annoyed me because they made me lose my record. These guys annoyed me because they killed me countless times. There are very few times during this game that I stopped enjoying myself. This was one of those moments <laughs> where it almost tipped the balance over yeah. in that direction. But, you know, it's just one of those ones. I think it a lot a of good this boss, thing though. is... It's a good boss. It's yeah. an extremely challenging boss once you've kind of gotten over some of the slightly more questionable aspects, few as they may be. And I think that ultimately when you're struggling like that, just I tend to put the game down and come back to it the next day and have a much better time. Sometimes you just got to put it down. Okay, but enough whining about the <laughs> difficult boss. I think it's time <laughs> we moved on to the next section. So after defeating this extremely delinquent duo, we run to confront Mido and question him about his plans to revive the queen. Mido laughs condescendingly as it actually turns out that he has no use for her as he's already collected enough data already. After taunting our crew some more, Mido draws his sword and with one slash kills his three enhanced guardsmen. Triple kill! 
As they fall to the ground, leaving behind their floating relics, Mido then casts them away from view and they fly off into the distance. As Mido begins to pull up a screen to show our gang what's going on elsewhere, he then announces to us that the cage has been unlocked sounds pretty ominous it really does doesn't it but we then go to following the journey of the three speeding relics across the land and they burst into an underground chamber sitting atop a throne of blood gregorio silver is hit in the chest by these relics and he absorbs them after this absorption has taken place he begins to frenzy starts his frenzied transformation into a big old wolf monster that we don't really get a good look at, at this point but you can see it's a wolf yes yeah. yeah back at our home base an earthquake shakes the ground and our crew back at home look outside to see that the red misty field that was covering the surrounding area is fading and soon disappears entirely down on the ground back in the city we can see other evidence now looking outwards in awe at the fading mist and running towards it celebrating the fact that their captivity appears to have come to an end oh they shouldn't have been that happy as they run towards the mist however a giant beast resembling a corrupted black red-eyed griffin with the face of a lion emerges and attacks everyone yeah and this this enemy is very god eater right is it oh, okay because i now know that this is in, like in the same universe as god eater it makes perfect sense <laughs> <laughs> fine just as it's about to actually pounce on one of the aforementioned city dwelling revenants the beast is suddenly swept away in a large gust of red mist the scene then fades to black Back. now back to our confrontation with juzo mido at the top of the crypt spire yes and he's not a happy bunny he seems very frustrated that the red mist appears to have returned and whatever plans he had seemed to now be on hold clearly the relics he used weren't enough to overcome silver and he's managed to resist keeping the red mist afloat Mido now reveals that Silver had previously denied his attempts at further research into using the beasts that have overrun the world, with his ultimate goal of furthering the power of the Revenants. In order to prevent the dangerous research, Silver created the Red Mist to seal away all of his work. According to Mido, this act sealed the Revenants away from the majority of the beasts that came into the world following the collapse. However, in doing so, he also halted the Revenants' progress and hopes of evolution, basically saying that natural selection couldn't take place. The monsters now held back by the Red Mist have apparently been evolving over time, and are now an existential threat to the revenants obviously this is all mido's spin on things so we can take this with a pinch of salt raven lunatic this guy wacky scientist yeah and also all-time classic bad guy villain vibes as well yeah. like think of the most classic anime villain that is exactly what mido's like with a sprinkle of looney tunes villain in there though, honestly yeah that's a fair <laughs> comment our gang obviously isn't willing to bargain with this madman, and after all the people he sacrificed to turn into the successors, he's not about to get away with these things so easily. Lest we forget that he f***ing turned Yakimo's love interest into a successor, and she's now dead. So... Yeah, there's a lot of vested interest amongst the gang in terms of getting rid of this Mido dude. Yeah. Everyone's pissed at him. Yeah, he's, he's not a nice man. <laughs> That's been very diplomatic. But as we turn down one last offer from Mido to, in his own words, ascend together, f***ing lunatic, this man, Jesus. The fight then begins. And I'm going to let you go first on this with your opinions because I, I have a relatively funny story, at least I think it is, about what happened in my one. Mido basically is uh, kind of similar to a lot of knight enemies we fought before but with a big old sword, but he's got a pretty high command of the blood icker as well. So he has a lot of spells and sh he does, and he kind of uses those spells to enhance his sword attacks in his phase too as well. He does yeah. like a big slash where he ends up on one side of the room, but the splash kind of radiates outwards and then finishes with a little red-pink explosion type thing as well. I found that one of the hardest moves to dodge in the game because he often ends up not where you expected him, and also the slash is way wider than anything you'd expect him to do. So predicting where it's going to end up is uh, is quite a tough attack to dodge there yeah think rivers of blood it's not too dissimilar to that in terms of its range yeah absolutely it's got a big big range maybe even a little bigger i think actually in terms maybe. of wideness yeah. at least for sure i should also mention at this point that i think i'd only maybe attempted this guy like twice before i actually had james join me for the remainder of my playthrough so we actually managed to get this guy after maybe it was a handful of attempts i think four or five attempts we ended oh, up not saying even, no, that. not even that with him was it not Mido no, okay, was like maybe second go yeah we we made pretty short work of him in the yeah. end. I did like his attacks. They were cool in terms of the extra range he gets using his spells. But ultimately, yeah, we got rid of Mido pretty short order. Yeah, and saying that, 
Will and I got rid of him in pretty short order. I've mentioned before there that I think this is quite a funny story about what happened in my one. He has an attack, right, where he sort of slides on his knees across the arena a little bit. That's and right, And tries to yeah. slash at you. It gets lengthened in his second phase by kind yeah. of a delayed slash as well. What I'd done is I'd strafed round so I was sort of in a corner. He did that attack, right, but he did it from far enough away that I could just walk out. He was then in the corner and me and Yakimo wailed on him. He didn't even get into phase two. Oh, God. We literally killed him in about 30 seconds because he just slid <laughs> into a corner, had his back to us, and we're both using big weapons, so the stagger is insane. You done messed up, A.A. Ron! And obviously dumping all of your most powerful yeah. attacks into him as well. It's like, because yeah. you, you stagger him, and then it's like, right, well, now we can just combo. And then he, and he just never got out of it, because he couldn't dodge away, which is his normal strat, because he's in Fine, a corner, yeah. and we were blocking him in. I do remember you shouting at me at one moment, oh, don't get it, leave him in the corner. Yeah. I was wondering what that was about. It makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, <laughs> oh man, it was so satisfying. Because you fight me, though, literally straight after Blade Bear and Cannoneer, pretty much. You walk yeah, down the corridor. Yeah, almost no break. You're just chasing after Mido after he beats a hasty retreat, aren't you? Yeah, and to do that fucking bastard of a duel boss and then just walk into Mido and just made a mockery of it. It was so satisfying. You finally gain some confidence back in yourself as well. Yeah, and I was just like, oh, wow. <laughs> I remember this fight being tougher. But it's purely because <laughs> I just got lucky with positioning and then got lucky with my stagger RNG it was you know they're just so funny to me big old Mido and he gets beaten in 30 seconds <laughs> yeah like... absolutely he's kind of at this point the big bad of the game isn't he the main driving force behind all the problems for the most part yeah he is in fact the main antagonist of the game but not the final boss which we'll get on to shortly after finally putting an end to Mido and reducing him to ash he disappears in a blinding flash of red <laughs> he just he tells starts turning to ash and then just explodes. Yeah, I know it's kind of yeah less subtle than some of the other revenants. I'm being so dramatic in my death. It's like you just get like the death rattle, yeah, and then an explosion. Yeah, it's just like <laughs> oh man, you're so edgy. Jack tells us Silver has resisted Mido's attempts to frenzy him, and he is currently in a lull at the moment. Although he is still on the brink of frenzy. To prevent this, we have to use our powers to defeat Silver and absorb his relic. However, doing so means that we will need to sit on that throne forever as the Keeper of the Red Mist. We travel to the end of the spire, up some more walkways and stairs, and finally arrive at the provisional government outskirts. Yeah, which is, looks pretty familiar, didn't it, Will? It did, yes. Very familiar in terms of a lot of the blood codes that we absorb throughout the game. We actually, as we mentioned last week, go into various memories of people, and that is essentially where this last level of the game is set. Yeah, it was set in fact the memory that we went into of our own memory. It's oh exactly God, the same. A memory level. within a memory. Again, too inception -y for me, this. But I'll continue. Um, so just think, basically, similar sort of, like, destroyed urban areas to what we've been in before, but a little bit more military presence about, you know, there's sort of sandbags, there's, like, ammo crates that are used as the, as the um, scenery and the landscaping and stuff. Abandoned tanks and whatnot. And sort of construction-looking vehicles as well, very urban. Um, and just lots of thorns of judgment sticking out everywhere. Ground zero, if you'll remember from our memory so exactly that enemies there is a lot of dog type enemies that we mentioned a little earlier in the pod and we also get a sort of a small army of ladies armed with various weapons including sort of swords shields a kind of a pike type thing as well yeah yeah they're quite fun to fight they're quite quick moving and they have some decent combos they're very tall they're kind of maybe at least a good like nine feet tall or something like yeah, that yeah a lot of poise heavily armed yes but still Definitely. agile. And interestingly, uh, all of the enemies in this area are now are wearing sort of bright white armor. And this is because these are all of Silver's guards, the provincial government guards. You may notice that this is the same armor that our good friend back at home base Davis wears. Of course. Yeah, I know. I kind yeah. of forget about Davis. He sort of falls yeah. into the background a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, he, he does look after depth maps, but you probably haven't engaged with those. It's sort of like side dungeons. Yeah, I think that there's definitely uh, quite a few aspects of this game that I kind of missed. Unintentionally, I will add, it's just kind of, I think that if it doesn't throw it up in front of you and when you're kind of on a roll, it's quite easy to miss without like regularly checking back at home base and speaking to everyone. Yeah, exactly. But the other notable thing about this area is also, this is where I asked one of the most important questions in the run for Will. Because as Will's mentioned, we were playing together at this time. We were just sort of shooting the breeze, killing some monkey enemies. 
having a good time. And I asked Will, yeah, Will, what armor are you using? And uh, I think at this point I it mentioned that I was using the like the Queen Slayer claw or something like that. Yeah. Which, uh, unbeknownst to me, I had actually been upgrading throughout my game, and it was actually not the piece of armor that I was intending to upgrade. Yes. Yeah, so, bit of context: you do have the option in this game to hide your blood veil, which just means that you're looking at the character you created, like the basic outfit that you had, unclouded by any of the vestige armor types that you can wear in the game and i obviously chose that option because i'd very faithfully recreated solid snake yeah. in the game and i didn't want him to be kind of covered in armor that was going to be covering him up yeah and as a result of this unbeknownst to will when you go into your own memory because it sort of starts you at ground zero and it's looking back in time you actually get unequipped from the piece of armor you're wearing and you get like the basic starting armor in the game again that's right the game kind of dumps you back in almost what i would describe as the default piece of armor it is the default it's the a starting armor that you get in the game and to give you an idea of how good the starting equipment is the two starting weapons you have even when fully upgraded do about 300 damage at most and bear in mind a fully upgraded hammer that i'm using does 2100 for context <laughs> yeah pretty big you know that gives you an idea of how bad this basic equipment is even when it's leveled up and will's using the basic bitch armor but without realizing yeah up until that point i had completely missed out on that fact and also confusingly the game just doesn't automatically switch you back no. so it does seem like it's pretty not well thought out there that i get for kind of i get that kind of for time reasons and canonical reasons and continuity that you'd be wearing your old armor in those bits and you couldn't be rocking around with all your upgraded stuff in the flashback before you'd got any of it however the game absolutely should have automatically teleported you back into your current gear set when that memory had ended very weird choice to not place you back in that default well, straight away here's the f***ed up bit as well you can use all your sh because you keep your weapons, right? You can oh, you true. can actually re-equip your armor, but then when you beat Queen's Knight at the end of that area, it equips that basic bitch armor once again purely for the cutscene where you put your claw in the back of the queen. That's the right. only reason that they give it to you. I see, of course. That's the only reason. It's, it's a really poor design choice. It doesn't like impact the game too much if you know about it. Well, now I know that also it's just that one time. It's not like every time you go back into a flashback. No, it's, it's just that one time, yeah. And obviously I wasn't really, well, clearly wasn't paying attention whenever I came to upgrade my armor because I was just clicking on the thing that showed that was equipped. And the, and, the, and the thing that is interesting as well, just to make make it absolutely perfect is that will had told me that he was using an armor called the night claw which was the armor he wanted to use because it's a claw drain attack which is the same as the queen slayer claw he just wouldn't notice indistinguishable based on the fact yeah. that you can't actually see what you're wearing yeah so it's just perfect storm so we told Will about this fact. He changed his armor and suddenly was doing about 500 more damage per hit. Straight up, I was doing double damage on my hits because I finally was able to get the last upgrade on my weapon. Then I went back to the actual armor that I was supposed to be using, fully upgraded that to as much as I could get it as well, which I think was a plus nine out of a possible plus 10. And then, yeah, all of a sudden it turns out that if you switch the right blood codes, you wear the right armor, you upgrade your weapon, you actually start doing some real damage in this game. Now we can finally play the game. Yeah. and stop being such a kind of support character in the background. Yeah, if only you'd known that before Blade Baron Cannoneer. Oh man, honestly, that fight would have been so much easier. I think I went into that fight at level 98, which I think is roughly leveled for it, but doing half the amount of damage that I could have possibly done honestly couldn't have been worse for that playthrough. Really unfortunate, but I'm glad that I was able to advise Will when I was. I was just giving Yakimo his time to shine for the rest of my playthrough before I picked it up with you. I was just honestly, just, you know, I was cheerleading for Yakimo. Yeah, which is fair. Yakimo's a, a great partner. We work our way through the outskirts with the rest of our gang, fighting against the hordes of Lost and working to purify the blood springs in our continued attempts to remove the frenzy-inducing miasma from the area. As we work our way past the ruined streets, we encounter our next boss, who is, looks awfully familiar from the memory that we were just talking about. It's the same area, this. And yes, it is. Now wearing the white armour of the provincial government, it is the Queen's Knight Reborn. That's right. So, familiar boss fight here in terms of some of the moveset as well. Yeah, I believe phase one is identical to the phase one in the previous fight phase two has a slight change instead of just getting like a sort of diving attack from the air and a bit of teleportation you still get that i think it's got one extra move at the end of the combo but the knight can also bring up a sort of green area of effect around itself which inflicts the leak debuff once again so draining our ricker that's right and doing that prevents us from using any of our special attacks so really got to do our best to avoid any of that but yeah so this was another one that uh, we fought together kind of like a big 
Pretty fast-moving enemy, a bit reminiscent of the Black Knights in Dark Souls. This one, however, has a large sword and shield and wings, enabling it to sort of dash around the arena and do lots of ground power moves as well. Yeah, but not fly. So wing, Yeah, not fully fly, useless. no. It's more like just kind of zip it up into the air and then quickly barrel down into the ground. But otherwise, this really didn't give us too much trouble, did it? I think this was a first or second attempt? Uh, I believe it was second. At- no, I think this one had been first attempt. I don't recall us dying to this one. I think we just did it. Yeah, nice, nice. Yeah. Good boss fight, fun. Move set was kind of, it did have a few tricky bits in it, but obviously after you've taken the hits a few times, you learn to get around it and yeah, uh, yeah all round satisfying. So after putting the Queen's Knight to bed, once again, we move on to the provisional government centre. Yes, yeah, so and this is sort of just basically, it looks kind of like a sort of tomb when you're sort of walking around it. It does pretty much, yeah, it kind of of castle interior slash yeah underground mausoleum yeah. tomb yeah yeah but it's actually just um, the ruins of a building threaded with what looks like kind of veiny blood bits yeah and sort of roots yeah blood roots yeah and obviously there are no thorns of judgment down here so it's not them because we are no there aren't point. thorns of judgment although there are weird tentacle thorns that oh, shoot out walls and impale bastards. you whenever you get past yeah they're the worst they're very easy to miss as well seeing as that they're not visible until you've actually kind of almost stepped Stepped on the invisible pressure plate that activates yeah. them. All you can see is like holes in the wall. But if you're just running through a level, you're not necessarily looking for that sort of thing. So they can properly get you. And in terms of enemies in this area, basically just got more of these white knights, if you like, and then a few more lost. That's right. They resemble kind of silver's guards, right? Yeah. As we're into the provisional government area. It makes sense. Yes. And these guys also drop very cool weapons. The Argent Wolf sets. Shout out to the Argent Wolf hammer, which became my main weapon at this point. I did get one of those. However, I was still really feeling the Rubelite Piercer bayonet gun that I was using. Yeah. So uh, I kind of stuck with that. It's bling though, that weapon. So I don't It know is. It's bling. Very nice looking. We continue our fight through the centre and encounter yet another boss fight. Well, if you want to call it a boss. I refer to it as half a boss. But it's time to fight the Attendant of the Relics. But before we get into this boss fight, we should just explain a little bit about these attendants. So, attendants are destined to serve each successor until they expire, and as it's revealed to us in the story, Eo, who we met at the start of the game and who is now in our crew, is also an attendant. Throughout the course of the game, we support Eo to figure out her reason for existence and to help her understand her role as an attendant. With our help, Eo discovers that the attendants are manifestations of the Queen's thoughts and desires, and they act as retainers for the successors, basically catering to their every need as they are locked away, trying not to frenzy and in the case of the boss coming up i currently suspect that we're about to fight the attendant of gregorio silver himself yes which i don't think is too far-fetched a theory at all although it's not not ever explicitly stated i don't think this is a theory this is purely speculation i should add but given that it's identical to all of the um attendants that were outside the successors that we fought before shout out to lena and and Phoebe? Phoebe? Leader and Le- Thebe. Thank you, you very much. Is that what you said they were called? <laughs> yeah, Leader or Leda and yeah. Thebe, yeah. And then there's another one <laughs> who I don't think Will remembers either. No, that one's no. Yeah. <laughs> not EO. But yes, so we, we walk into a room and we fight attendant to the relics and uh, this was embarrassing. This is the only boss fight in the game where you actually fight someone who is very comparable to a hunter because I think even that Oliver dude at the very start of the game is a bit more kind of, he's frenzied and stuff like that. Whereas this one feels like, in fact, I think it does have the exact same move set of EO who you can actually use as a companion in the game. Pretty Although much, yeah. she is somewhat more aggressive. Yeah, and I don't think she uses quite as much magic, but that might have been because we just absolutely ganked her and she just couldn't yeah. do anything <laughs> to stop us. Staggered for days and swiftly over in probably under a minute, I think this Comfortably boss fight was. under a minute, yeah. Yeah, maybe under 30 seconds. Yeah. And I think it only took longer in my solo playthrough because she kept running away. Very, very easy. This is a story boss fight. Don't think it's meant to challenge you. Yeah, it feels like you're bullying. So yeah, so not much else to say apart from that. She does have a halberd, but she never got to f***ing use it because we dicked her. And I think she does use spells. Could have used spells. After defeating the attendant boss, it's time to head onwards to our final destination, the Jail of the Stagnant Blood. Yes, a very small area to run through. It's literally one corridor at the bottom of a massive lift. Elevator for our US listeners. And uh, we head in to face a now fully transformed Gregorio Silva in his sort of wolfy guise now, aka the Skull King. 
even though he doesn't got a fucking skull on him. Really weird, that. And odd, I, I reckon that's a translation issue there, I'll be honest. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think that, that one just didn't quite make it past QA there. Yeah, because he's obviously, he's called, like, I think his sort of nickname is the Argent Wolf, which is where the army name comes from and stuff. So they could have gone for something like that. Maybe the Wolf King? Yeah. <laughs> No, the Skull King, it sounds way more metal. It does. And and to be fair, he looks pretty metal too. He does, he does. So this is kind of like a big double blade wielding wolfy boy. His blades kind of massively increase with size during phase two. Yeah, they're sort of gold blades with like tubes of blood on the outside. And as such, these things are pretty hefty. So a lot of his attacks are very obviously telegraphed. He has a lot of kind of spinny, slammy attacks that you can fairly easily dodge. Yeah, but they do a lot of damage if they hit you there. That's exactly the trade-off, isn't it? Yeah. With those attacks that are much easier to dodge, you are going to get really punished if you do get hit by one of them however this was another boss fight that i think we managed to do without very much difficulty at all and this was a first try for us again yes and it was a first try for me on my playthrough too and i was surprised because when i did my first ever playthrough of this game i actually found this quite hard um it just goes to show <laughs> how, how much i've improved at these sort of games i guess so since then but yeah absolutely yeah but um it's actually a really cool fight he does have some cool moves his, his phase two is quite similar to his phase one but he just has a blood aura around him and it's just a bit more powerful does a couple more combos yeah it does some more combos and it elongates the kind yeah. of the lingering and the range of his blades as well I yeah think. and he can do a sort of moonlight great sword-esque when he slices it sends out a beam of red towards you that's right yeah yeah which yeah. when you actually because you when you beat him you get this sword for yourself you only get one though it's really harsh it does actually allow you to do that beam attack if you have Icar and do a strong attack it's pretty cool Yes, no, a, a very enjoyable boss fight, and immediately after defeating this blade-wielding wolf, as it finally falls to the ground, Silver loses control of his relic, and he begins to pull in all of the other relics from the surrounding area, and actually absorbs them all, transforming himself into a new beast entirely, the Virgin-born. So what, is he a virgin? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and this boss basically looks like um, the Xenomorph from the Alien films, but white and sort of... Blue tubes traveling yeah. in its kind of under bits and it's sort of instead of having like a solid sort of mane if you like i don't know what you'd call it headpiece yeah um, it's kind of I guess so, yeah. it's more antlery it's got like decoration and holes in it and stuff it's quite an ornate looking boss it doesn't look too dissimilar to the architecture of the cathedral of the sacred blood actually now i think about it it's true there's definitely a bit of a recurring theme there should mention it's got a lot more arms and legs than a regular xenomorph and also it's a lot larger than one as well it's kind of it's got a little bit of although I wouldn't really say they're comparable in terms of look. It's got Elden Beast vibes in terms of the fact that it's a giant leggy boss. It's definitely one of the larger bosses that you have to fight in the game. It for sure feels like the final boss yeah. of the game, doesn't it? It definitely conveys that. It? A hell of a health bar. And we've spent a lot of time avoiding the various moves that it has. It has like a giant AOE attack to prevent you from spending too much time underneath its legs, just hacking away. Obviously, that is the kind of a lot of the main tactic for this because being in front of it is obviously bad news. It's got various kind of sweeping attacks that it can do that you have to avoid. Yeah, and what you want to do really is you want to hit its underbelly slash face if you can. Basically, wherever there's blue tubes and it's underbelly that's where you want to aim for because if you just hack it his legs you're doing 300 minimal, 500 damage minimal. or something whereas if you hit him on the blue tubes you're getting sort of up to a thousand damage very high physical defense incredibly high elemental defense not too bad but just the high defenses just mean that it takes so long to do anything and then when you get to phase two it has attacks that can just one shot you and are really hard to avoid that's right it really does kick off then and it's really important that you're using all of your special abilities buffing all of your team mates yeah. and yourself wherever possible just to make sure that damage really counts to be honest because as james mentioned this is a big big health bar enemy yeah and bear in mind as well that we've just fought silver the first time you fight it and you immediately fight virgin born after fighting silver you don't get any of your health potions back you don't um heal or anything like that whereas typically when you defeat a boss in this game you do get everything back and um, that's right yeah there's always at least some sort of break in between yeah with this one you get nothing and so we were sort of low health i think i had two potions left i think i was on about four or something yeah. yeah so typically kind of less than half and with this you need a lot of health so you can stall it because it's got such a high health bar that you just need to be in it for a long time and its attacks typically going to take your health to very close to zero and you're going to need to use at least two of your healing items to bring you up to over half health so yeah yeah you'll be chugging through health items a lot if you're taking those hits 
minutes. Yeah, and bear in mind you get 10 in the game max. And when I was playing with Will, I'm a phantom, so I get cut in half. So I had five. Really tough. But ultimately really satisfying as we did finally manage to defeat this one, albeit after maybe a good five attempts, I want to say five this one took. Five or six attempts, I think. But it was Depending I, on whether you include yeah. the first one where we started with reduced health items. Yeah, exactly. yeah. And I was very pleased that I managed to get this on my third go in the solo run. Very nice indeed. It was a very satisfying moment. Although perhaps, uh, you know, ended a little soon, depending on the choices that I made at the end of the game. I think that the ending that we both achieved this time is definitely the the shortest. It's not quite a sure ending Sekiro style no. as in the game doesn't kind of end halfway through. However, in terms of a satisfying ending, this ain't it. Yeah. <laughs> we got the middling ending. But yes, so after defeating the last boss, in order to save everyone, our character absorbs the relics and assumes their role as the Keeper of the Red Mist. In doing so, all the revenants are protected from the horrors outside and the world remains in limbo with the remaining revenants continuing in their search for blood beads striving to survive against the ever increasing forces of demons and the red mist so this ending is very much a kind of cycle continues style ending we definitely haven't really solved any problem there we've just kind of prevented everything from going to complete sh However, the kind of imminent and ever continuous problem of the search for blood beads, as well as the fact that we're having to fight the lost and the horrors following the great collapse, none of that is really rectified based on this ending. No, what happens is we just sit in the throne, fall asleep, and Eo is the only one that stays with us. And she just sort of stays there, not even as our attendant, she turns to stone like straight away. There is some sort of hint that there is perhaps a chance that we might be awakened when we're next needed, yeah. that they do mention, but whatever that might be be we never really find out exactly it's very 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 sort of neutral as, as the neutral ending probably <laughs> should be i guess yeah but, absolutely but for me personally this was a massive disappointment because i have obviously played the good ending in my first playthrough and that goes off into i'm not going to spoil it but that goes off into sort of a bit of a tangent you sort of find out what the other characters are doing it even looks like there's a, a very short conversation based epilogue as well oh yeah there's a, yeah there's a there's a big old sort of cutscene at the end and like there's a really touching moment and then the ending makes you feel all warm and fuzzy inside. It's great. <laughs> But Whereas with us, it was kind of like, okay, and roll credits. <laughs> yeah, literally it was. It was just like, yeah, you're sitting in the throne, you fall asleep, EO dies, and then it's like, okay, sweet. Until next time. Yeah, yeah which uh, I think you're right. It probably is, uh, you know, a fair ending to get for a pretty middling ending there. Typically, yeah. you want to kind of have a polarizing ending in terms of you either did the good thing or the wrong thing. The way that the other endings, I did get a brief glimpse of them. However, I'm very keen to kind of get into that on my subsequent playthroughs of this game, so we won't get into those too much. No, I don't want to know anything about the bad ending because that's the only one i haven't done it's definitely something to look forward to get into for sure bit of a disappointing end to what was a fantastic game in my opinion i, I love this game yeah i haven't been quiet during this playthrough just how much i've been enjoying this game other than a few select moments so i feel like we've kind of covered a lot of the gameplay elements and, and things that we really pick up what is putting down all in all i think that this was a great game it was a very good kind of borrowing if you will an homage <laughs> if you will a lending of certain 99% of the elements of the game, if you will, from yeah. Dark Souls series. But it works really well, and there is nothing to hate about that. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I love everything about this game. Uh, there are, as you mentioned, there are a couple of rough bits. But I must say, with this being my second playthrough, it wasn't anywhere near as bad. No, yeah, so, yeah. That hopefully that's a little crumb of comfort when you do go back. You get you you get some time to adjust to the rough edges. Yeah, exactly. And hey, who knows? Maybe we'll play a full run through together at some point. Looking forward to it, man. I'm definitely up for it. Okay, man. Well, I really enjoyed playing through this part of Completionist Corner with you. We'll be back next week with a new game as part of this section. But I think for now, it's time to round off this episode. One last time for the people in the back. Let's lay out the socials. You can, as always, find the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and pretty much anywhere else you get your podcasts by searching for Total Pod Mode. We also post regular video content of our playthroughs, stream highlights, as well as the podcast on our YouTube channel, Total Pod Mode. You can also find us on Twitter by searching for at Total Pod Mode, or one word. And whilst you're there, you can find me at Mr. Bames, and I'm also on Twitch under twitch.tv forward slash Mr. Bames underscore TPM. And you can find me at Hoodafunk on Twitter, and I'm also also on Twitch under twitch.tv forward slash hoodafunk. Okay, James, once again, with a very special thank you to all of our listeners. We appreciate you as always. Thank you for making it this far. We'll see you guys next week. Yeah. Peace and love, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>